Y ahora veamos la entrevista que nuestro director Carlos Fernando Chamorro le hizo al médico psiquiatra forense Terry Coopers, psiquiatra forense experto en la salud de los reclusos en Estados Unidos. El doctor Coopers ha testificado más de 30 veces ante las cortes estadounidenses sobre los efectos que tiene en los prisioneros el sistema carcelario en ese país, específicamente en aquellos que han permanecido largos periodos en confinamiento solitario y ha evaluado los casos de más de 500 personas en confinamiento solitario. El profesor Coopers ha sido además consultor de varios centros de salud mental y del Departamento de Justicia de Estados Unidos y es el autor de cinco libros y varios reportes especializados sobre los efectos del confinamiento solitario en la salud de los presos. El experto habló sobre la severidad de la tortura que viven los presos políticos en confinamiento en el Chipote en Nicaragua y los daños psicológicos que causa. Veamos lo que dijo. Doctor Coopers, usted ha testificado más de 30 veces ante las Cortes de Estados Unidos sobre los efectos psiquiátricos y fisiológicos que provoca en los prisioneros el sistema carcelario de Estados Unidos y específicamente en aquellos prisioneros que han permanecido largos periodos en confinamiento solitario en su celda. ¿Cuántos casos individuales ha evaluado como psiquiatra forense? I testify in individual cases and class action lawsuits where the entire prison population is part of the plaintiff class. And I would say I have interviewed and testified for over 500 people in solitary confinement. ¿Cómo se define lo que es el confinamiento solitario en el sistema de prisiones de Estados Unidos y a nivel internacional? By consensus, We've agreed that 22 or more hours in a cell, either alone or with a cellmate, with relative idleness, a lack of meaningful activities. That's the definition of solitary confinement. Some of the solitary confinement uh, situations are called segregation, restrictive housing unit. In the United States, there are often lockdowns in prisons where the prison is out of control and the authorities are trying to figure out what's going on and who is committing the violence. So they lock everybody in their cell 24 hours a day. That is solitary confinement. It's very common in the USA, but it's not counted as solitary confinement by the authorities. ¿Cuáles han sido los principales hallazgos de su evaluación como psiquiatra forense sobre el impacto del confinamiento solitario en el sistema de prisiones de Estados Unidos? I have uh, interviewed and examined over 500 people. There are some symptoms that are just about universal. For instance, very high anxiety. People tell me that they have never been so anxious in their life. As soon as they're placed in a solitary confinement cell, and it builds over time. Panic attacks are very common. Severe insomnia. There are noises in these units, the clanging of doors, the footsteps of the guards, but there's also a lot of agitation and anxiety which keeps people from sleeping. There are disturbances of thought that often become paranoia, And that's because they have no feedback from anybody about their thoughts. So they have a thought, well, the guards are going to come here and kill me. And usually when we have thoughts like that, most people have paranoid thoughts off and on, but we reality test them with other people. If you're in a solitary confinement cell, you cannot reality test and therefore the anxiety builds and you become paranoid. Compulsive acts, pacing, cleaning the cell, counting cinder blocks are very widespread. Despair, people feel, even if they're only in solitary confinement for a limited amount of time, they feel that they're never going to get out and they're going to die there. Um, anger builds up and it's an irrational anger. And people tell me that they can't um, control the anger and they're afraid they're going to get in trouble with the officers. Uh, concentration and memory are big problems. So I ask people, why don't you read if you're able to, if they give you something to read? And, and people in solitary tell me, well, I can't remember what I read the page or even the paragraph before. So it is no, it's no use reading. They have trouble concentrating. Suicide is very prevalent. 
In the United States, on average, 50% of prison suicides, and suicides in prison are much more prevalent than in the community at large, but 50% of the suicides that happen in jail and prison occur in a solitary confinement setting, even though maybe 5% of the population is in solitary confinement. Those are the main... Nicaragua, en la cárcel del Chipote, hay cuatro mujeres presas políticas, Dora María Teyes, Tamara Dávila, Ana Margarita Vigil y Sudien Barahona, que han sido encerradas durante más de 460 días en celdas de confinamiento solitario. Nunca han tenido el derecho de comunicarse con otra persona o de leer un libro o escribir. Y solamente las sacan de sus celdas una vez a la semana a recibir sol y aire fresco por unos minutos y solo reciben visitas familiares cada 45 días. ¿Qué efectos podría tener sobre su salud a corto y mediano plazo este tipo de confinamiento solitario prolongado? What you're telling me is, is just horrible. And the solitary confinement in Nicaragua that these women are subjected to is much, much worse than solitary confinement in the United States. Although solitary confinement in the United States is very damaging to human beings. But for instance, consider the door. If the door has bars on it, you can look outside, you can see the hallway. Maybe you can talk to somebody in the next cell by talking out into the air. But if there's a solid door, you're even more in isolation. If there's no window to the outside, you're cut off from nature and human beings need some interaction with nature. If it's cold or it's hot, that makes the conditions worse. And particularly with these women, I understand that they're not permitted reading materials or permitted to write. And that's another extreme deprivation, which increases all of the symptoms and psychiatric disability that I've described. Caragua también hay más de 30 presos políticos que están aislados en su celda con un compañero o compañera, pero no tienen derecho a hablar entre ellos. Tampoco tienen acceso a la lectura y les otorgan muy poco tiempo de sol y aire fresco en la semana. Algunos están en pequeñas celdas de castigo de 2 por 2 metros. ¿Cuál podría ser en ese caso el impacto en su salud de este tipo de aislamiento en la cárcel? You're, you're describing torture. This is torture by all definitions. Uh, in the United States, there are space requirements. I think uh, the requirement for a single cell is eight feet by 10 feet, so 80 square feet. By court precedent in the United States, prisoners in solitary confinement must be given five hours a week of exercise, of recreation. And generally that's done five days a week, an hour in a recreation area. They don't have enough space to exercise big muscle, but at least they get out of their cell for the five hours. As I understand it, these women are not allowed out of their cell, are not given anything to do in their cell, and then are not even allowed to talk to a cellmate. What we have found by research is that having a cellmate actually on average is no help. You, you still suffer the effects of solitary confinement. Sometimes if you have a, uh, a simpatico cellmate, you're able to talk and that lessens uh, the, the deprivation. But they even, uh, the, the authorities don't even let two cellmates talk to each other. I've never heard of that kind, that level of cruelty. All of these things would magnify the harm. So the psychological damage would be even greater and longer lasting. Usted describió algunos impactos cognitivos, sociales, psicológicos que puede producir el aislamiento prolongado en prisión. ¿Cómo puede identificar el daño y las heridas que no son externamente visibles? They're not externally visible, but there are physical changes in the brain and the body decays and decays rapidly. So we can identify that. We have to actually talk to someone who's been in solitary to find out what's going on. Universally, and I've never met anybody who did not say this, their personality changes. So people tell me that before being in solitary confinement, they were gregarious, they enjoyed social events, they, they sought out other people. But since being in solitary confinement, they have closed down, they've turned inward. 
they don't even enjoy talking to their neighbor if they're allowed to talk to their neighbor. In Nicaragua, they're not even allowed, but they become a different person. And if you talk a little about what's going on in their thinking, they will tell you that they've turned inward. They will tell you that they feel numb. Some people describe it as a zombie effect. That is, I believe, it's my theory, and I've written about this, that people in solitary confinement work so hard to dampen the anger that springs up in solitary because they don't want to get in trouble with the officers guarding them. So they work very hard to suppress their anger. As they suppress their anger, they really are suppressing all their other feelings at the same time. So they become numb or they say, I feel dead. Um, Lisa uh, Gunther, a philosopher in the United States, has talked about social death, that in solitary confinement, someone becomes less than a human being. And um, this, is a, uh, this is, first of all, long-lasting and very damaging effect. So she says, although such people are physically alive, their lives no longer bear a social meaning. They no longer count as lives that matter. That is the purpose of the state, is to basically kill people. But they kill them while leaving them alive with no scars visible. In Nicaragua, in February of this year, the preso político Hugo Torres murió in an hospital bajo custodia de la policía después de haber estado seis meses en aislamiento en la cárcel de Chipote. ¿Qué tan peligroso puede ser este régimen de aislamiento y confinamiento solitario para las vidas de los presos políticos? That's terrible. That's a really a tragedy. He is murdered. Um, he was tortured and murdered. And there's been some very good research in the United States that the morbidity, that is the likelihood that someone will die within one year of being released from prison is very much higher for people who have been in solitary confinement. There are physical reasons for that. You're in a cell by yourself. You don't get much exercise. You don't get aerobic exercise. The food is usually horrid. And so by all measures of physical illness, uh, you, you, you become sick and you don't get good medical care. So you're likely to die sooner but also there's the psychological damage and a loss of a will to live. And so either suicide or just not caring after you've been broken down by solitary confinement leads to a much higher mortality rate. A pesar de estar sometidos a tratos crueles y a largos periodos de aislamiento y confinamiento solitario, los presos políticos han declarado su inocencia en los simulacros de juicio han hecho huelga de hambre para demandar que les permitan la visita de sus hijos y se han convertido en un símbolo de resistencia nacional. ¿Pueden los prisioneros políticos desarrollar recursos psicológicos o intelectuales que les permitan soportar estos largos periodos de tortura y aislamiento? Absolutamente. We just lost a national hero in the United States, Albert Woodfox who is one of the Angola Three. Angola State Prison in Louisiana is an old slave plantation that was converted to a prison. He spent 44 years in solitary confinement. Then he was released several years ago, wrote a wonderful book called Solitary, and he just died. And it's really a tragedy. He was in his early 60s. For political prisoners, there's actually a reversal of the symptoms that I said. I've written that the aim of torture is to destroy the individual's will, to break the individual down and obliterate a sense of autonomy and agency, thus turning that individual into a shell of a person who lacks the will to resist or even to be human in the sense that human, being human requires personal agency. I have found an amazing number of political prisoners and political people in solitary confinement. And they tend to be the healthiest people in solitary. And they do things, for instance, a willful uh, program where you know that you're in a situation of torture and you're going to be destroyed by it unless you do something. So they train themselves in discipline. They do physical energy. 
They do exercises for their mind because they realize that if they do nothing, they're going to lose their mind. So they work very hard on staying stable. And for political prisoners, there's the understanding that I'm here as a political act, as a repressive political act to destroy me. And they vow they're not going to destroy me. I'm going to survive. It's the knowledge of what's going on socially, and it's the insistence on agency. I will resist, and the people I know out in the world, including the public that I don't know personally, are going to support my resistance because this is wrong. And that kind of conviction tends to counter the destructive effects of solitary, not entirely, but it helps people stay stable and stay sane. Doctor Coopers, usted está familiarizado con las reglas mínimas Nelson Mandela de Naciones Unidas para el tratamiento de reclusos en las cárceles. ¿Tiene alguna recomendación como psiquiatra forense para los familiares de los presos, para las organizaciones internacionales de derechos humanos o para la comunidad internacional sobre la situación de los presos políticos en Nicaragua? Yes. First of all, there should be no political prisoners. There is absolutely no reason to put someone in jail or prison because of what they believe or what they say. That is just absolutely anathema to the democratic process. Now, the prisoners who are in prison, we have to, first of all, release most of them. There's no social meaning to putting people in prison. The um, Mandela rules in the United Nations come from a worldwide campaign to end solitary confinement because it's torture. So um, um, Mandel, the uh, special rapporteur for the United Nations on torture, recently he stepped down from that role, but he said that any uh, period in solitary confinement greater than 15 days, first he said it's a human rights abuse, and a year later he said it's torture. And I agree. And that is a worldwide consensus right now. So the World Health Organization in the United States, uh, it's the National Commission on Correctional Health Care, which accredits jails and prisons. And nobody should be in solitary confinement for more than 15 days. Several states in the United States have passed laws. California is now considering one that's on the governor's desk to end solitary confinement and to limit the time in a cell alone to 15 days. So there's an international movement. The Mandela rules are very, very important in the United States and obviously in Nicaragua, there is a non-compliance with those rules. Dr. Coopers, usted también ha sido consultor para Human Rights Watch y Amnistía Internacional. Existen otros países en que se aplican condiciones carcelarias de aislamiento y confinamiento solitario durante más de un año, como las que se han impuesto a los presos políticos de Nicaragua? Yes, there are countries that are known for it. For instance, the United States, which claims not to practice torture. That's actually not true. The United States tortures plenty of people. And solitary confinement is torture. The United States has more people in solitary confinement than any country in the world. But Countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Russia, the United States sends political prisoners to those countries to be tortured because of the fear that if the torture occurred in the United States, that people would be upset by it. But if Egypt is doing the torturing, then they're not so upset. So there, there are horrible situations in many countries, and I'm very upset to hear that this is going on in Nicaragua, where we for decades supported the Sandinistas to, to change this kind of uh, repressive society. But here in Nicaragua, it's some of the worst solitary confinement in the world. So everything that I have said as a basic standard, for instance, the eight foot by 10 foot cell in the United States, the five hours of exercise a week is not done in Nicaragua. The conditions are much, much worse. The solid doors, the lack of a window to the outside, all of these things are more deadening to people. So the torture is more severe. There are other countries that do that. And that's a great tragedy worldwide. And I think mostly it's invisible. 
mostly the public doesn't know about it. And that's why the uh, oppressors are allowed to get away with torture. But I think the more that the people who are in that situation, including political prisoners who are the leaders of this movement, make public the awful things that happen in public institutions in the name of the people, the more people are going to get upset about it and say, we can't let this go on. Gracias por ver este video. Con tu sintonía podemos vencer la censura televisiva en Nicaragua. Y si aún no lo has hecho, suscríbete a nuestro canal en YouTube. Necesitamos tu apoyo a Confidencial para seguir informando a nuestras audiencias y divulgando la verdad.